Hey everyone, before I start the episode, I wanted to let you know that we now have On Wildlife merch. Go to onwildlife.org and click shop now to buy On Wildlife shirts, stickers, magnets, and much more. Okay, enjoy the episode. Hello, welcome to On Wildlife. I'm your host, Alex Ray. On this podcast, we bring the wild to you. We take you on a journey into the life of a different animal every week. And I guarantee you, you're going to come out of here knowing more about your favorite animal than you did before. The animal that I'm going to be talking about today is a large reptile that likes the warm weather. In fact, they're the largest lizards in North, Central, and South America. Some species are also some of the most threatened animals in the world. So sit back and enjoy the tropical breeze as we talk about some scaly green reptiles, iguanas. There are 45 different iguana species, which already tells us that there's going to be a lot of variety when we talk about them. And they're highly adaptive animals. They can be found in a bunch of different environments and habitats. They can be found in tropical forests, deserts, on islands, and can live near water, on land, and in the trees. But as you'll see, many iguanas are not actually native to where they're living right now. And we're going to talk about that later on in the episode. As I said earlier, they're the largest lizards in the Americas, but because there are so many different species, they obviously come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. They can be less than five inches long, like the spiny-tailed iguana, or they can be more like the green iguana, which is around six and a half feet long and can weigh up to 11 pounds. The green iguana is probably the one that you think about when iguanas are mentioned. They're, of course, green, they have long tails, and what looks like spikes running down their back in a single line. They're also the most popular reptile to keep as a pet. One of the coolest species to look at is the Grand Cayman Blue Iguana, which is a beautiful turquoise color, and they mostly just lay around on rocks. Another really unusual species is the Galapagos Marine Iguana, which is the only species that swims underwater. And because they swim in the ocean, they have to get rid of all this salt water that they take in. So they actually expel salt by sneezing it out. It's really cool to look at, but also really gross. So I suggest you check it out. And just like a lot of reptiles, iguanas can live for a pretty long time. They can live anywhere from 6 to 60 years. The blue iguana has the longest lifespan of any iguana, which ranges from 25 to 40 years in the wild and over 60 years in captivity. But the marine iguana is on the other end of the spectrum. They only live for about 6 years in the wild. Unlike most lizards, iguanas are mainly herbivores. They eat a variety of plants, but they can also eat some insects. They feed on leaves, vines, fruits, and flowers. Even the marine iguana, which I said swims in the ocean, doesn't eat fish. They eat the algae that grows on rocks underwater. Because of their high fiber diet, iguanas have special microbes, another way of saying bacteria, in their digestive system that actually ferments their food so nutrients can be properly absorbed. And just like how humans can store fat near their abdominal area, iguanas have fat stored under their jaws and in their necks. Their bodies store fat in case they don't have access to food for an extended period of time. They can use their stored fat for energy. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I'm going to start talking about some strange iguana behaviors. The person that I want to recognize on this week's episode of Notable Figures in Science is Dr. Sanghamitra Banyopadhyay, who is a computer scientist from India. She received her PhD in computer science at the Indian Statistical Institute, where she's currently working as a professor. She also won the Infosys Prize in 2017 for engineering and computer science because of the work that she's done in taking computer algorithms and using it to analyze data in biology. And because of this work, she helped advance research on breast cancer and Alzheimer's. 
Her work led to the discovery that there were genetic markers that indicate someone could get breast cancer. She has greatly impacted the world of computer science and the medical field, and for that, she deserves to be recognized. If you want to learn more about Dr. Banyo Padier or this series, check out onwildlife.org. Okay, we're back. Let's talk about iguana reproduction. Most iguanas reach sexual maturity at age three or four, though some can reach it a little earlier. They tend to breed in the dry season so that when their eggs hatch, it's the wet season, which means there's more food available. Iguanas are polygynandrous, meaning that both males and females will have multiple mates. This is kind of weird in the animal kingdom because many times only the male will mate with multiple partners or the female will mate with multiple partners. But the males still have to work to impress their females. Each male has a specific territory, and oftentimes there are fights between two male iguanas over the same territory. To impress the females, they'll bob their heads, extend and retract their dewlaps, which is a flap of skin under their necks, and bite the female's neck. I don't think that's the way I try to impress someone, but I guess that's why I'm not an iguana. After mating, females are able to store the sperm that males give them for several years. Females lay their eggs around 60 days after they mate. Over the course of three days, they can lay up to 65 eggs. Their nests are around 18 inches deep in the ground, and females aren't as territorial as males, because if there's a lack of space, they'll share their nest with other females. And the parents have it kind of nice because they don't really have to put in much work to take care of their children. After the eggs hatch, the baby iguanas are on their own instantly. So because iguanas are on their own right from birth, they need a lot of adaptations that are going to help them survive. Young iguanas are a light green to blend in with their environment. And green iguanas are arboreal, meaning that they live in trees. And they're actually really good climbers. Their sharp claws help them cling on to the trees. So their green coloration helps them blend in with the leaves. This is crucial to their survival because one of the main predators of these iguanas are hawks. And a lot of people would call using coloration to blend in with your environment camouflage. And they're correct, but I'll give you a scientific word that you can use instead. Crypsis. But there are different types of crypsis that don't just involve seeing. You can use crypsis to describe an animal hiding its scent from other animals or hiding its sound from other animals. Okay, I'm done with my mini science lesson. Back to iguanas. Some iguanas are also able to change their colors like a chameleon. The Fiji banded iguana has some amazing colors. They come in shades of blue, green, and yellow to blend in with the treetops. They can even turn black if they're threatened. And some iguanas don't stay the same color their whole life. As they get older, they shed more, and when this happens, their color gets darker. Not only are some iguanas really good at climbing trees, they're also fantastic swimmers. They hold their legs close to their body and use their tail to propel themselves like a fish's tail. Their skin is also water resistant and tough in order to avoid cuts and scrapes. But their awesome adaptations don't end there. Iguanas have amazing senses of smell, hearing, and vision. And this is really important for avoiding predators and finding their next meal. And they can also protect themselves in a variety of ways. So even though they look cute, you really shouldn't mess with them. Their tails are sharp and they snap them into the air as a defense mechanism. Another cool thing about their tail is that it can break off if they're caught by a predator, but it grows back without any permanent damage. It's better to lose a tail than to get eaten, so it's probably a good strategy. Okay, we're going to take our last quick break, and then I'm going to talk about why iguanas sunbathe. Time for today's trivia question. How much can a cloud weigh? A. Almost zero pounds. B. Up to a thousand pounds. C. Up to a million pounds. Or D up to a hundred million pounds.
The answer is C, up to a million pounds. Even though they look fluffy and light, when you actually think about it, clouds are just water, but condensed. So think about how heavy a bucket of water is when you fill it up to the top, and then multiply it by millions. Okay, welcome back. Along with other reptiles, you'll see iguanas basking in the sun. To understand exactly why they do this, it's important to understand what it means to be cold-blooded. Like all reptiles, iguanas are cold-blooded, and this doesn't mean that they have cold blood, rather it refers to the way in which they regulate their body temperature. Warm-blooded animals, like mammals, are able to automatically regulate their own body temperature through their nervous system, regardless of how cold or hot it is outside. We call warm-blooded animals endotherms. Therefore, cold-blooded animals, also known as ectotherms, are unable to regulate their own body temperature. They depend on the surrounding environment, which is why it's really important for iguanas to stay warm, so they can maintain their body temperature. If their body temperature drops below about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, their muscles essentially become paralyzed and they fall into hibernation. And when I say fall, they literally do fall. When it gets cold in places where iguanas live, like Florida, they can fall out of the trees because they can't move or hold onto a branch. They can recover from these cold temperatures, but falling out of trees makes it a lot more dangerous. And this doesn't happen that often in their native habitats, like Central America, where the temperatures are extremely hot, but it can be more common in Florida because it can get a lot cooler there. As a side note, some iguana researchers are especially interested in the cold tolerance that iguanas exhibit, particularly those that are not native to the habitat that they're living in because of the growing threat of climate change. Not only does climate change increase the overall climate of the Earth, it also makes the weather a lot more unpredictable. So it's interesting to think about if these iguanas will be able to deal with the threat of climate change. Anyways, back to sunbathing. Much like humans, iguanas sunbathe also for vitamin D. For a long time, scientists thought that iguanas only basked for thermoregulation. But a recent study suggests that vitamin D has a significant impact on their behavior. Even though this study was done on chameleons, it can really be applied to all lizards. They found that chameleons who had a low vitamin D diet basked significantly more than chameleons that had a high vitamin D diet. Therefore, it appears that lizards can gauge their internal vitamin D levels, and they do it with really good accuracy. Obviously, they don't have doctors to take their blood and tell them to get more sun, but scientists still aren't sure how they measure their vitamin D levels yet. It's also thought that basking in the sun helps with digestion. When the temperature decreases, iguanas reduce their food intake. Iguanas are really important to the ecosystems that they live in. Because they eat plants, they're great seed dispersers. They're also the prey species of large birds of prey, which are on the decline pretty much everywhere in the world right now. But even though they're helpful to their native habitats, they can harm habitats that they're not supposed to be in. They can overeat vegetation and have been observed to eat some endangered species of snails. But they're really just considered an inconvenience in areas that they're not native to. Unfortunately, several species of iguanas are also endangered, such as the Fiji banded iguana, the marine iguana, and the Jamaican iguana, all of which are endangered because of humans. We're destroying their habitats and introducing other invasive species. For example, mongooses, which are invasive to Jamaica, feed on Jamaican iguanas' eggs and young, making it really hard for their populations to grow. And because iguanas are cool-looking reptiles, they also fall victim to the pet industry, which is actually the main reason that they've been introduced to places like Florida and Texas, where they're not native. Even though they're beautiful and amazing creatures, they're really not easy to take care of. And there's such a big demand for iguanas right now that people have started to capture them from their own habitats. There are even iguana pet farms. It's extremely important to protect these animals in their native habitats because they do so much for other plants and animals that live there. Some organizations that are already helping iguanas that you can take a look at right now are the Iguana Specialist Group, the International Iguana Foundation, and Iguana Verde. 
Thank you so much for coming on this adventure with me as we explored the world of iguanas. You can find the sources that we used for this podcast and links to organizations that we reference at onwildlife.org. You can also email us with any questions at onwildlife.podcast at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Instagram at on underscore wildlife or on TikTok at onwildlife. And you can look at our merch on our website. Don't forget to tune in next Wednesday for another awesome episode. And that's On Wildlife. Listening to On Wildlife with Alex Ray. On Wildlife provides general educational information on various topics as a public service, which should not be construed as professional, financial, real estate, tax, or legal advice. These are our personal opinions only. Please refer to our full disclaimer policy on our website for full details. Mm-hmm.